they cannot live here, and so to gain your allegiance, they are employing many of the techniques that we have described. We will continue in our description to clarify these things. Our arrival here has been thwarted by several factors, not the least of which is a lack of readiness of those whom we must reach directly. Our speaker, the author of this book, is the only one with whom we have been able to establish a firm contact. There are a few others who show promise, but we must give our speaker the fundamental information. From the perspective of your visitors, as we have learned, the United States is considered the world leader, and so the greatest amount of emphasis will be placed here. But other major nations as well will be contacted, for they are recognized to hold power, and power is understood by the visitors, for they follow the dictates of power without question, and to a much greater degree, than is even apparent in your world. Attempts will be made to persuade the leaders of the strongest nations, to become receptive to the presence of the visitors, and to receive gifts and inducements for cooperation with the promise of mutual benefit, and even the promise of world dominion to some. There will be those in the corridors of power in the world who will respond to these inducements, for they will think that there is a great opportunity here to take humanity beyond the specter of nuclear war into a new community upon the earth, a community which they will lead for their own purposes. Yet these leaders are deceived, for they will not be given the keys to this realm. They will simply be the arbiters in the transition of power. This you must understand. It is not so complex. From our perspective and vantage point, it is obvious. We have seen this occur elsewhere. It is one of the ways that established organizations of races who have their own collectives recruit emerging worlds such as yours. They believe firmly that their gender is virtuous and for the betterment of your world for humanity is not highly respected, and though you are virtuous in certain ways, your liabilities far outweigh your potential, from their perspective. We do not hold this view, or we would not be in the position, that we are in, and we would not be offering our services to you as the allies of humanity. Therefore, there is a great difficulty now in discernment, a great challenge. The challenge is for humanity, to understand who its allies really are, and to be able to distinguish them from its potential adversaries. There are no neutral parties in this matter. The world is far too valuable, its resources recognized as being unique and of considerable worth. There are no neutral parties who are involved in human affairs. The true nature of the alien intervention is to exert influence and control, and eventually to establish dominion here. We are not the visitors. We are observers. We claim no rights to your world, and we have no agenda to establish ourselves here. For this reason, our names are hidden, for we do not pursue relations with you beyond our ability to provide our counsel in this way. We cannot control the outcome. We can only advise you as to the choices and decisions that your people must make in light of these greater events. Humanity has great promise and has cultivated rich spiritual heritage but it is without education regarding the greater community into which it is emerging. Humanity is divided and contentious within itself, thus making it vulnerable to manipulation and to intrusion from beyond your borders. Your peoples are preoccupied with the concerns of the day, but the reality of tomorrow is not recognized. What profit could you possibly gain by ignoring the greater movement of the world and by assuming that the intervention that is occurring today is for your benefit? Surely there is not one amongst you who could say this, if you but saw the reality of the situation. In a way, it is a matter of perspective. We can see and you cannot, for you have not the vantage point. You would have to be beyond your world, outside the sphere of your world's influence, to see what we are seeing. And yet, to see what we see, we must remain hidden, because if we were discovered, we would surely perish. If your visitors consider their mission here to be of the utmost value, and they consider the Earth to be their greatest prospect among several others, they will not stop because of us. So it is your own freedom that you must value and that you must defend. We cannot do this for you. Every world, if it seeks to establish its own unity, freedom and self-determination in the greater community, must establish this freedom and defend it if necessary. Otherwise, domination will certainly occur and will be complete. Why do your visitors want your world? It is so very obvious. It is not you they are interested in particularly. It is the biological resources of your world. It is the strategic position of this solar system. You are useful to them only insofar as these things are valued and can be utilized. 
They will offer what you want, and they will speak what you want to hear. They will offer inducements, and they will use your religions and your religious ideals to foster confidence and trust that they, more than you, understand the needs of your world, and will be able to serve these needs to bring about a greater equanimity here. Because humanity seems incapable of establishing unity and order, many people will open their minds and their hearts to those whom they believe will have the greater possibility for doing so. In the second discourse, we spoke briefly of the interbreeding program. Some have heard of this phenomenon, and we understand there has been some discussion about this. The Unseen Ones have told us that there is a growing awareness that such a program exists, but incredibly people cannot see the obvious implications, being so given to their preferences in the matter, and so ill-equipped to deal with what such an intervention could mean. Clearly, an interbreeding program is an attempt to fuse humanity's adaptation to the physical world with the visitor's group mind and collective consciousness. Such offspring would be in a perfect position to provide the new leadership for humanity, a leadership that is born of the visitor's intentions and the visitor's campaign. These individuals would have blood relations in the world, and so others would be related to them and accepting of their presence. And yet their minds would not be with you, nor their hearts. And though they may feel sympathy for you in your condition, and for what your condition may well turn out to be, they would not have the individual authority, not being trained in the way of knowledge and insight themselves, to assist you, or to resist the collective consciousness, that has fostered them here, and given them life. You see, individual freedom is not valued by the visitors. They consider it reckless and irresponsible. They only understand their own collective consciousness, which they see as privileged and blessed. And yet they cannot access true spirituality, which is called knowledge in the universe, for knowledge is born of an individual's self-discovery, and is brought into being through relationships of a high caliber. Neither of these phenomena are present in the visitor's social makeup. They cannot think for themselves. Their will is not theirs alone. And so naturally they cannot respect the prospects for developing these two great phenomena within your world, and they are certainly in no position to foster such things. They only seek conformity and allegiance. And the spiritual teachings that they will foster in the world will only serve to make humans compliant, open and unsuspecting, in order to garner a trust that has never been earned. We have seen these things before in other places. We have seen entire worlds fall under control of such collectives. There are many such collectives in the universe. Because such collectives deal with interplanetary trade and extend over vast regions, they adhere to a strict conformity without deviation. There is no individuality amongst them, at least not in any way, that you could recognize. We are not sure that we can give an example in your own world of what this could be like, but we have been told there are commercial interests that span cultures in your world that wield tremendous power and yet are governed by only a few. This is perhaps a good analogy for what we are describing. However, what we are describing is so much more powerful, pervasive and well established than anything that you could offer in the world as a good example. It is true of intelligent life everywhere that fear can be a destructive force. Yet fear serves one and only one purpose, if it is perceived correctly, and that is to inform you of the presence of danger. We are concerned, and that is the nature of our fear. We understand what is at risk. That is the nature of our concern. Your fear is born because you do not know what is occurring, so it is a destructive fear.